Hello, thank you for being here with us today and welcome to this official side event of Climate Week NYC. The urban energy transition, powering green and just cities for the 21st century, hosted by C40 Cities, promises to be an inspiring event that brings together mayors from around the world, climate and energy specialists, global finance experts, business leaders, and youth climate activists to showcase the coalition of stakeholders working together to accelerate the transition to clean energy in C40 cities and beyond. My name is David Miller. I'm the Managing Director of International Diplomacy at C40 Cities, which is a network of almost 100 of the world's biggest cities who are taking essential, urgent, and collaborative action to cut emissions in half by 2030 and create a future where everyone can thrive. As the master of ceremonies of this event, it's a great honor for me to welcome all of you. If you'd like to follow along on social media, please join the conversation using the hashtag the future we want or hashtag clean energy. Mayors of the world's cities and the communities they lead and are a part of are at the front lines of the climate crisis and also have been at the front lines of the COVID pandemic. And they are already leading in taking the steps towards a green and just recovery from both crises that puts social and racial equality and environmental protection at the heart of their recovery efforts. We know that the shift towards clean, renewable energy is absolutely critical if we are to avoid a climate catastrophe and achieve the healthier and more sustainable future we want and need. Over the next 90 minutes, you'll hear from mayors, climate energy experts, business leaders, and young activists who will describe the efforts that they're taking to accelerate the energy transition away from fossil fuels and towards cleaner technologies that offer multiple benefits, including job creation and economic opportunities for many. As an official side event of Climate Week NYC, this event has also been developed in partnership with the Climate Group. Chief Executive Officer of the Climate Group, Helen Clarkson, has made a point of being here to welcome our speakers and all of our attendees with her message. Thank you so much, Helen, for making time for this event and for partnering uh, so much with C40 on many initiatives. The floor is yours. Thanks, David, and thanks so much to you and, and C40 for inviting me. Um, it's great to be here. It's, I'm here in uh, New York City, actually, for Climate Week NYC. Um, and our theme for this year is getting it done. And what we mean by that is, you know, we've heard a lot um, from activists who've started saying, you know, stop telling me about 2050, tell me about now. Um, and I think all of us who work on this know it's not, it's not quite that simple, but at the same time, there is that real sense that, yeah, 2030 targets, 2050 targets are necessary, but they're not sufficient. We want to know about action today. And that's the theme for the week. And it's great to see this event sort of picking up that theme. At the opening ceremony, a couple of things uh, of Climate Week NYC, a couple of things happened which I wanted to share. So one was a fantastic announcement from the New York governor, Kathy Hochul, who announced two major green infrastructure projects which uh, to power New York City with wind, solar and hydropower projects from upstate New York and Canada. So a fantastic shift that we're hearing about how New York City is going to be powered, um, which will create jobs um, and bring clean energy into the city. Um, but the other thing that came out of the opening ceremony was that we did a poll with, uh, with the audience, both online and in the room, about which system needs the most urgent attention. And I was really surprised, 42% said energy. So it was, the, it, was, it was the runaway winner. And I think that's really interesting because I think a lot of people think that the energy transition is done. I heard someone say that a few years ago, oh, you know, this is all done now and it's not. The progress um, is encouraging and you know we've got ever decreasing costs of clean technology but we know the rate of deployment of renewables is not sufficient to get to near net zero by 2050 so I think it's really important to have events like this and complete, uh, continue to emphasize you know the role of cities and all 
uh, non-state actors in meeting these targets. So I'm looking forward to uh, this event and to hearing about uh, City's increased leadership on this really critical issue. Thank you very much, uh, Helen, for that message of the importance of, of action. Uh, we echo that concern. And as a Canadian, I'm very pleased to hear that uh, we're assisting in New York City becoming uh, uh, clean from an energy perspective. And also thank you very much, Helen, for the incredible work the Climate Group does and continues to do. Um, now I'd like to welcome our next speaker who is the chair of C40 and the mayor of Los Angeles, Mayor Eric Garcetti, who unfortunately cannot join us live this morning, but has shared with us a powerful video message. Under Mayor Garcetti's leadership and during the most challenging circumstances of the pandemic, he has accomplished so much for climate action, from pushing tougher 2030 emissions reduction goals for all cities, to helping to elevate the voices of Global South mayors in the broader climate conversation, to rallying a broad coalition of cities committed to taking climate action ahead of the UN climate negotiations at COP26 in Glasgow. His leadership has been transformative for Los Angeles and for communities around the world. And I'd now like to share Mayor Garcetti's message. Hello everyone. I'm Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti, Chair of C40 Cities, and I'm so excited to join you this morning for Climate Week. We all know that we are in the midst of the fight of our lives, for our health, for our planet, for our future. And collaboration is the only way we can win it. So I want to acknowledge Helen Clarkson for her incredible efforts to mobilize leaders from every part of the globe to gather for this important event. Thank you. This kind of cooperation is how we are going to achieve a zero carbon future. That's how we're going to recover from a devastating pandemic and how we're going to reimagine a path of sustainability, equity, and quality jobs in our cities. As chair of C40, I have the privilege of collaborating with mayors worldwide to accelerate our bold climate actions and hold each other accountable, to do everything possible to make our cities healthier and more equitable. Running our cities on renewable energy is the bedrock on which an equitable zero carbon economy is built. And that is why we're here today, to launch C40's Renewable Energy Declaration. Mayors from cities around the world, including Los Angeles, have signed the declaration, committing to taking immediate actions to accelerate the clean energy transition and address energy inequalities that impact millions of people across our globe. Mayors are ready to transform the global energy system to decarbonize their grids, power a green and just recovery from the pandemic, and create sustainable and equitable communities. So my message to all the national leaders and investors, clean energy entrepreneurs out there, let's work together. Let's double down on our ambition. The city of Los Angeles is already powered by nearly 40% renewable energy today, and we're well on our way to reaching 55% by 2025 and 80% by 2030. We've partnered with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory to answer an important question, whether 100% renewable energy is achievable for Los Angeles. In the groundbreaking LA100 study we released earlier this year, we got an answer and it was a resounding yes. LA100 shows the world that not only a 100% clean energy grid is possible, but it's affordable, reliable, and equitable as well. Empowered by these findings, I committed LA to 100% clean energy by 2035, years ahead of our initial goal. And our municipal utility, the Department of Water and Power, will invest well over $10 billion in clean energy infrastructure this decade and keep investing in innovation, public health, and good paying green careers. We pledge not only to eliminate coal from our portfolio, but to break new ground by converting our last remaining coal plant to one that runs on clean, renewable hydrogen. But we need every city to take immediate and transformational climate action if we are to limit global temperature rise to the 1.5 degrees Celsius target set out in the Paris Agreement. That is why C40 is working hand in hand with United Nations High Level Champions for Climate Action to build a global movement through our city's Race to Zero campaign. Our goal is that by COP26 in Glasgow in just a few short weeks, as many as 1,000 mayors of cities large and small will stand together, committing to bold climate action and the principles of a global Green New Deal, and to reaching net zero emissions by 2050 and a fair share of the 50% global reduction by 2030. As of today, 829 cities have already joined the effort. 
The renewable energy transition is available for all cities, no matter the control of their grid or not, the size, and whether or not they are industrialized. So join us. Distributed energy systems offer opportunity, offer empowerment through energy independence, cleaner air, and cleaner jobs. And this is true even for local communities, including the most disadvantaged. They can and must be a part of our renewable energy transition. You see, we're all citizens of the same earth. We all share the same atmosphere and the same risks of climate change. And we must act together. Cities, utilities, regulators, and national governments must work in unison to decarbonize our energy system. With climate change hammering down on our cities, it's time for all of us to step up and meet this moment. So I invite all cities to join us in this groundbreaking, critical, and important declaration. Thank you all for everything you're doing. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Garcetti, <clears throat> for those inspiring remarks. The leadership of Los Angeles is extraordinary. And I do want to emphasize uh, the point Mayor Garcetti made that Los Angeles is on a path uh, to all entirely clean energy. And if Los Angeles can do this, anyone can do this. So when we hear people say this isn't possible, it is possible. Los Angeles has proved it for all of us. It's now my very great pleasure to introduce the next keynote speaker, Demi Lola Ogunbide, who is the CEO of Sustainable Energy for All, Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All, and the co-chair of UN Energy. We're really honored that you could join us today and we look forward to your remarks. Thank you so much for having me today and you know, good morning or good afternoon to everybody. I'm particularly delighted to be speaking at this event on the urban energy transition. Cities use over two thirds of the world's energy and contribute heavily to emissions from transport and urban infrastructure, such as heating, transport again, electricity and other need and others need to be decarbonized and like the mayor said in the video and done quickly at the same time almost 25 percent of urban dwellers in the region i come from south sub-saharan africa are faced with energy access issues the pandemic has severely impacted our societies and our economies but it's also given to us an opportunity to bring about a paradigm shift shift in the way we choose to move forward. For cities, renewable energy and energy efficiency solutions can create local high quality job opportunities, reduce air pollution, improve public health, and create a more inclusive livable city. 
progress in cities is critical for us to accelerate progress towards our sustainable development goal, especially sustainable development goal seven, which is access to affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all by 2030, and also has to be in line with our Paris Agreement. One fundamental thing that I need to share with you today is that with all the goals we have, universal access is what really brings us together. If we do not achieve universal access by 2030, we cannot achieve our climate goals by 2050. This is why this week, the UN General Assembly and the United Nations Secretary General is convening a high level dialogue on energy, which is the first time in 40 years that this is actually happening because it's critical that we need speed and scale and it's not okay to leave a billion people behind. One of the key outcomes of the high level dialogue, the energy compact, and I'm really glad that the 340 renewable energy declaration is part of the UN energy compacts. By committing to switch municipal electricity consumption to 100% renewable energy by 2025, or deploying renewable energy systems on all feasible municipal assets by 2030. These mean cities are leading the examples to many private sector and definitely federal government. We are really happy to stand with c 4 and also encourage the rest of the UN to do the same. It's important that c 4 is calling on national and all city governments to prioritize clean energy solutions in their planning, procurement processes, and potential for setting up manufacturing and assembly. And it's also important that as we think about transition, we need to really put people at the center of it. It's really, really great, the outcomes of cities like Los Angeles, but we shouldn't forget the cities, many of them in Sub-Saharan Africa that have a different way to transition, but they still need to transition all the same. And I really hope we can achieve a just transition that truly leaves no one behind. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Demi Lola, for those remarks and for emphasizing the connection between access to energy um, and uh, ensuring that everyone is lifted out of poverty. And uh, in your role, you also have a responsibility as a commissioner for the Global Commission to End Energy Poverty and the co-chair of COP26 Energy Transition Council. And it's uh, very important and impactful for us to hear those issues of, of addressing poverty and inclusion and energy supply together. And we certainly hear your <clears throat> call for action by cities from around the world. The full list of cities who signed the C40 Renewable Energy Declaration is available at c40.org forward slash energy declaration. And of course, remember to join this conversation on social media using the hashtags the future we want and clean energy. Um, and we wish you every success, uh, Demi Lola, in ensuring that the world moves towards the completion of Sustainable Development Goal 7. And on that topic, I'm very pleased to introduce to everyone our first panel session, where we'll be hearing about how harnessing the power of renewable energy transforms our cities. This panel will be hosted by Cassie Sutherland, who is the Acting Managing Director of Climate Solutions and Networks at C40 Cities. And immediately prior to assuming her current responsibilities, Cassie held the position of Program Director for Energy and Buildings at C40, where she was overseeing C40's support to cities on reducing energy consumed by existing buildings and ensuring new buildings are efficient from the start as well as cleaning the energy supply to buildings and beyond. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Cassie and our panelists. Cassie, over to you. Thank you, David, and welcome to you all to the first panel session, as David mentioned, focusing on harnessing the power of renewable energy to transform our cities. Uh, my name is Cassie and, and I'll be your host today, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to three very inspiring female panelists. So please join me in welcoming, uh, firstly, Ulrike Yardfeld, who is the Senior Vice President and Head of Business Area Heat in Vattenfall, Inna Braverman, the CEO and co-founder of Eco Wave Power, but also an award winner for the C40 Women for Climate Initiative, and finally, Lauren Faber-O'Connor, 
Chief Sustainability Officer, the Office of Los Angeles Mayor, Eric Garcetti. Welcome to you all, delighted to have you here. And before we jump into some great discussion with this panel, we do have a special message from another leading woman who could not join us today due to time zone difference. Uh, but Clover Moore, the Lord Mayor of Sydney, has shared a spe special message with us, showcasing the ambitious action plan she has implemented to transform her city. So please welcome Lord Mayor Moore. Hello and thank you for the opportunity to update you on the City of Sydney's efforts to reduce carbon emissions and provide a just transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy across our city. In 2008, when we adopted our Sustainable Sydney 2030 plan, we made the commitment to reduce our operational emissions by 70% by 2030. And I'm very proud to tell you that we have already met that target nine years early, just this year. The biggest single action we've taken to reduce emissions is to switch to 100% renewable electricity. Not only is it good for the environment, but it will also save our residents half a million dollars a year for 10 years. It has also resulted in the construction of wind and solar farms in regional Australia, generating more than 500 jobs. We are now collaborating with more than 20 surrounding urban local governments to support them in bulk purchasing renewable electricity. We have brought forward our target of a citywide net zero greenhouse gas emissions to 2035 from 2040, which we believe can be achieved through the further expansion of renewable energy, working with our partners to increase the efficiency of our buildings, better managing our waste, supporting active transport choices and switching to electric vehicles. This includes our City Switch, Better Buildings Partnership, Sustainable Destinations Partnership and Smart Green Apartments programs. One of our most recent innovations has been to develop performance standards for net zero energy buildings in partnership with industry and government, which can significantly reduce our overall emissions. Commercial office, hotel and apartment buildings produce 56% of the total emissions in our local government area. So the improvements in energy performance we are mandating through our planning controls will have a major impact. This will also assist in our transition away from the use of fossil gas. In addition, we are now working with other levels of government to deliver a program of activities to increase the take up of renewable electricity by individual residents and businesses. We continue to advocate to our national government for them to commit to a net zero emissions target no later than 2050 and update the national renewable energy target to provide certainty and to encourage investment. So thank you again for the opportunity to share the recent achievements of the City of Sydney. Thank you to Lord Mayor Moore for her leadership, vision and for that message that was full of hope and determination. It was such a perfect illustration of how we can harness the power of renewable energy to transform our cities. So I'd now like to get straight into the panel discussion. Um, and my first question today is going to be for a city partner. So Ulrika Yardfeld, thank you very much for joining us today. And in your opinion, how does the emergence of modern renewable energy technologies combined with the growing climate emergency really make cities key partners for a large energy company like Vattenfall? Thank you very much for, for having me. Um, well, Vattenfall is operating in the northwestern Europe, so I guess that also sort of put, contextualize what I want to say. But, uh, and we have made our, our purpose of our company is to enable a fossil free living in one generation. And um, when that comes, when it comes to industry sector and transport, that is a lot about electrification. But when we want to support our, the cities where we are in uh, their decarbonization, uh, we look also at the heating sector, the heating and cooling sector, which uh, sometimes often can stand for over 50% of the carbon emission. And it is a really difficult sector to tackle. And that uh, we typically look at district heating and cooling. And uh, this is a way of... I mean, that means that not, instead of looking at an individual household or an individual building, uh, you actually connect several buildings into a network in a district or sometimes an entire city. You connect that with hot water or cold water, depending on, on what you need. And then you can use available local resources to heat or cool those buildings. So this is uh, for, for cities that want to go really fast in, in, in decarbonizing their heating sector, uh, then this is what we work together with to, to enable. 
So it's not really a modern technology, to be honest. It's been around for a few thousand years. Of course, we use uh, digital technologies to, to control indoor climate, but the idea is very old and well known. Thank you, Ulrike. Great, great to hear about that. And I think particularly the um, he heating, which maybe district systems are more used to, but also the cooling opportunity that district systems provide as well. Thanks so much for your response. Um, so Ina Braverman, uh, I'd like to move on to the next question for you. Um, you're a fantastic entrepreneur, an innovator and a multi-award winner. So, so with this background, could you tell us what cities can do to support innovation in the energy sector? Uh, first of all, thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me here today. I'm very excited to see the declarations by uh, Mayor Garcetti and by the Mayor of Sydney. I think it's very, very important that cities uh, support uh, different uh, climate initiatives, especially energy, as energy, the way we produce it today is responsible for 60% of the global greenhouse gas emissions, according to the United Nations. Um, I think that cities have a big role because, first of all, they, they own a lot of the infrastructure. So, for example, my company, Kowai Power, is doing wave energy. And we do wave energy that connects to breakwaters and piers and jetties and other unused structures. For example, the city of LA has the port of LA with 12 kilometers of a breakwater. 12 kilometers is almost 100 megawatt of installed capacity of wave energy, which can help you reach uh, your goal much earlier than 2035 even, and make you a little bit even more ambitious. So I think that cities have a big role in setting the policies, in setting the legal framework, in setting uh, sometimes maybe even feeding tariffs or grid connect, uh, connection uh, initiatives, because if new technologies will have to wait for a decision to be made on the government level, sometimes it's very bureaucratic and it can take a lot of time. But cities, they have, they have a control for the destiny and the, the responsibility for the good lives of their citizens. And I feel that they can do a lot for the you know, quality of life of the citizens. Thank you, Ine. Super interesting to hear about their cities utilizing their, their regulatory role, but also their assets. And I love that in your head, kilometers of breakwater translates into megawatts uh, straight away. That's a great sum to have. Um, so thank you very much. And so Lauren, uh, you, you represent the city's voice on this panel. Los Angeles have made a very ambitious commitment through endorsing the C40 Renewable Energy Declaration. And you've been fully involved in this process as your capacity as Chief Sustainability Officer in the Office of Mayor Eric Garcetti. So could you tell us a bit more about how the city is tapping into opportunities to decarbonize energy supply that exists locally, but also beyond the city's boundary? And really, how does this help to build the next generation of urban energy systems? Thank you, Cassie. And it's such a pleasure to be a, a part of Climate Week and for C40 to be a, a partner in this work. Um, you know, I, honestly, it's, it's even being part of forums like this where you get to hear from some of the the experts in the field, like the incredible insight that, you know, you just provided, but you know, what we, it's, it's really in LA's DNA to be looking across a diverse portfolio of opportunities in our energy system, because as some have alluded to, we do have, and perhaps somewhat uniquely, we do have significant power, no pun intended, over our power system, over our electric system, because by charter, um, we own and operate what is actually the largest municipal electric utility. It's an electric and water utility in the country. So this is a municipally owned, um, you know, utility that is not just responsible for, as you see, lots of other energy systems, not just responsible for delivering the electricity, but actually we manage the entire energy system for Los Angeles from soup to nuts. So that includes the generation of the electricity, what resources we use. We make those decisions um, as well as how we manage the grid so that electricity is balanced and you know, the supply and demand is balanced 24 seven that is on the responsibility of the city um, as well as our you know, direct relationship to all of our residents and customers. And so when we say that we are figuring out the pathway to 100% renewable energy, that we are completely decarbonizing our grid. We actually mean we're figuring out all of those questions of how do you pair multiple types of energy systems and generation resources? How do you utilize the diversity of our resources, both in the city, whether that's on our coast, you know, in our coastlines, on our rooftops, other, you know, uh, other space for, for batteries and other facilities, 
um, as well as outside the city and the incredible transmission resources and infrastructure that we have that do provide a backbone to the city's uh, overall energy system. So that means pulling from other parts of the state, other parts of the Western US. You know, we are really leading the, um, I would say the economic transition in the energy system and the innovation transition through through now, uh, you'll see online in just a, a couple of years, the largest uh, battery and solar storage, uh, battery storage and solar uh, project in the country. And that will be coming online to service about 6% of the entire Los Angeles portfolio, between 6 and 7%, with one project alone. You combine that kind of, you know, you've got the assurance rain or shine from solar through that project with all the local distributed generation that we have the ability through programs like our solar incentives, through paying people to put roof, to put solar on their roofs, to a feed-in tariff, which really engages local solar developers, working with all of those types of, of um, you know, diverse leaders in the energy community to put together a system that is affordable, reliable, that ensures that there's access to clean energy for all communities. Thank you, Lauren. And it, it's so fantastic to hear all the work LA are doing and really from huge engineering projects right down to then the consumer and, and how they're actually going to get on board with the energy transition. So that's really inspiring. Thank you. So Ulrika, I'd like to, to come back to you and develop a little bit further what we were talking about and really ask, how can energy companies collaborate with cities to invent new business models and create the environment for the energy systems of the future? And what do you see as the key challenges that cities are still facing that you can help overcome? And what do you need from cities? <laughs> big question. Uh, yes, big question. Uh, no, but it, it's also very inspiring to hear also this. And I think electricity and electrifying is, is super important. And I think what when we are so sort of what we do mainly in my my department is working as i mentioned with heating and cooling and and electrification is not always possible and it also involves typically a lot of stakeholders that need to be involved and every house owner needs to take that decision and also the electricity needs to be available so what we have done with cities where we are i would say depends also on the market where we are uh, so if we look at, the, if we just start with Sweden, which is uh, where we're coming from as, as a company, typically in the 15 cities where we operate the district heating networks, almost 90% of all, build, all multifamily houses are connected to that network. And we use then what is available. For an example, in a small city like Vänersborg, we can use only the excess heat from the, from the steel mill that is, or the alloy factory industry that is very close by to heat the entire city with just that waste heat. Uh, in Uppsala, for instance, we can use the waste incineration and use the excess heat just to heat without using any resources. And when we are looking at maybe a little bit bigger cities, uh, when our partnership with uh, Berlin, I think what Berlin wants to do is to get out they have, uh, of, of the gas and, and uh, oil heating that they have at the moment. So about at the moment, about 30% is of the buildings are connected to the network. But then we formed a partnership with the, with the Berlin city uh, to agree on how, how to get out of coal, how we should invest and going hand by hand and setting targets, how to enable the city to transform uh, from, from the existing gas and oil-based heating until something that is fossil-free. Uh, we could not have done that, of course, without hand-in-hand uh, hand with the city. But maybe I think one of the most inspiring uh, most inspiring corporations that we have is in, in the Netherlands. Uh, typically in the Netherlands, you have almost only individual gas boilers as your heating, uh, per, uh, for heating and hot water. So, uh, one example is the city of Rotterdam. When we uh, the city went in, they um, also sort of sorted out the big house owning companies together with utilities, together with the city and the harbor. And at the moment, the city is uh, uh, sort of uh, through this housing organization, first refurbishing the buildings to minimize the energy use, connecting them to the district heating, and then we use excess heat from the harbor of Rotterdam to heat those buildings. And that transition is of course fantastic. We could never do that on our own as a utility, but we are here to help and then to invest and then to use our knowledge. So I think uh, this is the typical, we, 
where whatever city we are in, we need to adapt to to the local market conditions and what that city has in their minds, and then we can help. So I think if you what we need from the city is a willingness to cooperate with the, with actors that you know, we are we are here to help, and we but we cannot do it on our own without a very close cooperation. That's great to hear, Ulrika, and I really like the use of, uh, of sort of examples and live examples and, and thinking about the different roles we played there around aggregating demand, utilising waste or secondary heat sources and really coming together around that. So fantastic input. Thank you. So, Ina, a, a second question for you, if that's OK. So, so you work with cities and as an innovator, and I'm, I'm sure you've observed that sometimes there's not a crowd on the leading edge. So with the vision that you hold, you know, how, how do you think that energy companies can collaborate with cities to invent new business models and create an environment for the energy systems of the future? And also some of the key challenges that there are to overcome in achieving that. So I think that, uh, as I said previously, I think that city ha cities have major roles in the implementation of renewable energy for the benefits of their citizens. They can provide the place for it. They can provide supportive policies in order to enable a faster adaptation of new technologies. They can do a lot. Uh, I think that one of the main challenges in our field, wave energy, is quite a new uh, sort of renewable energy. So whereas many cities have already set, cities and governments have already set policies for solar energy and wind energy, not necessarily they have set policies or even licensing structures, even the simpler things for wave energy, because they didn't necessarily know that the technology readiness is already there and we're waiting to implement. So many times it happens to us that actually a port in a city or a city contacts us and says, we want you to come and build your power station. And you know, the construction can take, take us six months or 24 months. And we ask them like, which licenses do we need? Like, what do we have to do? And then the city goes, we don't know and starts developing the, the policy there. And then the policy development time takes longer than the construction time. And that's something that I think that we need to kind of close the gap. We need to be able to build, let's call it faster than what it takes us to do the policies. Uh, but on the other hand, there's also a lot of examples of positive collaboration. For example, uh, in 2019, uh, EcoWave Power and myself, I won the C40 uh, competition, Women for Climate competition. And as part of the competition, the city of Tel Aviv, Jaffa, committed to let us uh, install our technology in the port of Jaffa. And we're already in advanced uh, construction and we're going to open the power station by the end of this year. It will be the first time in the history of Israel that uh, wave energy will of officially connect to the grid. So they actually, because of the involvement of C40 and because of you know, the strong uh, interest by the city of Tel Aviv, they actually came up with a specialized policy and the energy ministry got involved and gave 50% of the funding and EDF, the French National Electrical Company, got involved through its subsidiary in Israel, EDF Renewables IL. So it kind of made the, you know, the snowball rolling in a positive way. So I think I would like to see the same thing happening uh, in other places around the world where you know, the government, the cities, and even large-scale electrical companies all join hands with new technology developers in order to make it happen. Thank you, Ina, and such a great example from Tel Aviv and wonderful to hear about that, but also to really hear and ask there about, you know, regulation being developed with innovators and with in innovation uh, technologies. So thank you very much for that input. And, and Lauren, over to you to really build upon some of what we've heard from Ulrika and Ina as well. And I'd be curious to hear a bit more about what leading the energy transition really means for a city like LA. And, and for you to build a little bit further on how your actions at a local level can transform the broader energy markets at the state and federal level. Over to you. Sure, thank you. You know, I think if the mayor were here, uh, he would, you know, he would say that, that leading means taking risks, that committing to, you know, what the science tells us we need to do when we don't necessarily have all the answers in that moment is is a must and that that is the only way that you know societies have advanced um he always encourages us to fail forward that we we can't fail in an endeavor because we didn't try now of course when it comes to the energy system you know we're working with with people's access to energy it, it's not something that you can take lightly and so you know to that end 
uh, we knew that as we were endeavoring to answer these questions, uh, that we had to figure out a, a really uh, comprehensive way to, and a really credible way to address some of these questions of how do we fully transition to a decarbonized energy grid, uh, you know, and not only do it in a way that is just something that works for Los Angeles, but the mayor also likes to say good mayors borrow and great mayors steal. And, it, you know, if it just sits in one location, that's not going to solve the climate emergency. And so, you know, what we do here has to be able to be um, modeled and, and replicated and scaled elsewhere. And so to that end, a, a, a number of years ago now, three, four years ago, we went to the Department of Energy. We went to the um, United States National Renewable Energy Laboratory, the near laboratory, the, the United States and really beyond for uh, renewable energy. And we said we'd really like some help figuring out this question of, and, you know, starting that question is, can we do it? Can we fully decarbonize our grid and on what time scale? And as you saw in the mayor's video, you know, the answer was a resounding yes, that we can do it much sooner that we th than we thought, and that there's actually multiple pathways to getting there. So now we're in the process of figuring out what is the right pathway for Los Angeles, but we're doing that in concert with communities. So we're doing that with you know, residents, businesses, ratepayer advocates, all within Los Angeles, clean energy, you know, um, uh, entrepreneurs, innovators, developers, who really can heed the call. You know, we need a, we need to ramp up solar, wind, distributed generation just across the board for a significant portion of our grid, we start to need to get strategic in different locations as we get to, you know, that final 20% of our, of our energy need. But right now we, we know we need to develop projects and we need to deploy much like what, what my you know, predecessors on the panel were saying is deploy, deploy, deploy. Uh, that requires significant partnership, not just with uh, private companies, also with labor in, in developing the, the talent and the, you know, the technical capacity to meet the need, uh, not just uh, the, you know, we have some amazing, amazing, you know, city workforce, but we need to double, triple. I mean, the, the workforce needs to grow and grow quickly. Um, the ability to, to get that infrastructure in the ground requires a lot of coordination between state, local, and federal jurisdictions. You know, our ability to cooperate with the state and local government on energy innovation. Uh, you know, we're looking at how do we, how do we, uh, some of those final puzzle pieces uh, beyond solar and wind and distributed generation include some long duration uh, energy storage or generation needs. You heard the mayor mention green hydrogen, renewably powered hydrogen. We also need to make sure that this transition is attainable for all communities in Los Angeles. If you have a home that, that you know, the roof can't support solar right now, what are the solutions? What are the programs that we can be providing as, as a city or working with state and local or state and federal partners to figure out those types of questions? This, so we're in solutions mode. And I think that that will only help us bring that transition even faster. We're not saying 2035 is our end goal. 2035 is the must have, but we're, we would accelerate and we have a history of accelerating every step along the way. Thanks so much, Lauren. And it, it's great to hear again that kind of the, the multi-layered uh, aspects to this decision and really this transformation and how LA is moving forward on, on a number of fronts. So sadly, we're reaching the end of this session, but I can't resist without getting another little insight from you all. And, and firstly to say, it's not that common to have all female panels. And I personally love it. I don't know if you're, I hope you're all enjoying it as well, but it's great to have an all female panel. So, so for the three of you, before we go, I'd like to take this opportunity to really ask you all the same question. And, and I'm afraid with time, just ask you to respond very briefly, just in, in one sentence. But women represent, uh, uh, remain underrepresented in the energy workforce, which means they're missing out on jobs and business opportunities and the industry is deprived of, of highly skilled and talented workers as a result. So what are the key actions that you think cities and businesses can take to improve gender diversity in the energy workforce? And Ulrika, maybe I can go to you first. 
Sure. No, I think it's uh, fairly simple. You need to set targets and measure and measure and measure. And I think uh, for Vattenfall, we set the target, I think it was five years ago, to, uh, to have 35% female managers. And that was a target, the KPI, and a bonus related target for all managers around the company. And it, of course, uh, proven results over the years. So you just have to make a decision and then make it happen. It's not more complicated than that, I think. It builds on the theme of action from our, our discussion today, I think. And so, Ina, maybe I could just ask you for your response as well. Uh, listen, unfortunately, the energy sector is one of the least diverse uh, sectors in the world, uh, with women representing only about 10% of the world workforce, and only like 5% of the executives in the energy industry are women. And um, me personally, I know you asked to keep it short, but that's something that's very important for me to say is uh, when I took my company public, uh, we went public on Nasdaq Stockholm and now Nasdaq US, we wanted to retain a PR company and the advice of the PR company was for me to step down as the CEO of the company because the young woman is not seen as an expert in the financial markets. That was the actual official advice. They said you need to hire men with, a, with white hair. That was the quote. So uh, for me, it's really important that not only cities and you know companies don't say things like this and don't do things like this, but we as women take responsibility. And even if people tell us that we can't or we're too weak or we're not capable to do something, we don't step down because if we step down, our daughters will step down and their daughters will step down and it will create a very negative chain of events. Such a powerful example, Ina, and, and we're very, very pleased you didn't step down, you didn't take that advice. Um, so, Lauren, maybe just over to you for the, the last reflection. Yeah, hearing that story is, to, I mean, it, it makes me want to throw my computer against the wall, but I'm so glad that, that you, you know, that, that you could sort of laugh in the face of something like that, because having both of you here is just completely inspiring to me. And I'm certain that, you know, when I, um, when I look at the, you know, the, the engineers and the policy leads um, and, the, and young people in Los Angeles, I know that this type of panel, this type of discussion is extraordinarily inspiring. I'm really proud that, you know, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power has, is doing a, quite a good job of targeting its um, outreach to colleges and universities. Uh, to, you know, women and diverse communities through, you know, different associations and different colleges and universities. They've, they've actually done quite a bit of work to try to do that kind of recruitment. But you also have to, once you get people into, so, so maybe, maybe women are joining this workforce more, but, but actually moving women into leadership roles that is, that's a key thing that I think is sort of the next step, because I think that STEM careers are on the rise for women because this clean energy transition is just such a, you know, no, no going back. But we're also really proud and, and to uh, Barika's point about setting KPIs, this has been an important uh, factor for the mayor and his commissions and boards throughout the city. And, and the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power actually just celebrated its first all women board professional board of the electric and water utility it's it's an incredible board and we're so proud and uh, i think i think their leadership is making a, a, a really big impact thank you lauren and that's great to hear and what a note a note to end on so uh, we've come to the end of this truly inspiring but also energizing panel session pardon the pun, but it was intentional there for energizing and the energy declaration. And um, I wish to really big, thank very much uh, Ulrika Yardfelt, Ina Braverman and Lauren Faber O'Connor for their time today and really thoughtful remarks. So a big thank you. And uh, I'll now pass it on to pass it back to David Miller. Thank you very much, uh, Cassie. I'd uh, like to add my thanks uh, to you. You're a natural and gifted moderator. And I, I want to thank the panelists as well. Not only was that a fantastic discussion about how to collaborate uh, between uh, business, technical experts, and cities to really expedite the clean energy transition, it was a real example of strong, bold women leading change. And in a, I hope you fired that PR agency. That's just outrageous. Um, not only is it offensive advice, but they were completely and utterly wrong as well. Um, so thank you for that panel. It was energizing. What a wonderful tone it set for the rest of our event. And we're really blessed. And I, I think it's uh, 
just fantastic that the next speaker is coming after this panel. The next speaker is Jade Lozada, who's a writer and climate organizer in New York City and was a local organizer for the global climate strike in September 2019, which brought together record-breaking 300,000 people on the streets of New York City for people and the planet. Jade's a member of the C40 Global Youth and Mayors Forum and also policy director at Triage. She's extremely passionate about empowering local youth in climate policy and decision-making, especially those from low-income communities of color. I find her incredibly inspiring. I know you will as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jade. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and I thank you immensely also for creating space for young people at such high levels of the climate movement. My name is Jade Lozada. I am a 19 year old climate organizer from New York City. And like David was explaining, I was a organizer of the September 20th climate strike two years and just a few days ago, which brought together 300,000 people for the planet. But just a few months before that, I actually skipped out on a different climate strike. It was March of 2019, and I understood the urgency of climate change at that time. But frankly, I didn't care enough to choose it over my school's karaoke day. And I didn't know then that climate solutions could address social justice issues. I had never heard the terms environmental racism or climate justice, let alone energy democracy but I knew at the time that people like me suffered from them. In New York City, fossil fuel energy sites poison low-income black and brown communities. It is no secret that these communities contract asthma at one of the highest rates in the country, as well as a host of other issues that place them at risk of dying from pollution, extreme heat, and tragically COVID-19. Climate change continues to perpetuate systems of inequality against low-income people of color in cities. Their lives are marked by the greatest irony to me, which is that many immigrated to the global north or the Western world from countries on the front lines of the climate crisis in hopes of escaping the effects of these same dirty energy systems that now poison them. The exploited do not only withstand weather changes, but also the physical, mental, and economic tests of low-wage labor that fuels climate change. The exploited endure violence, displacement, migration, exclusion, health complications, and oppression, creating a climate crisis that is cyclical. Now comes recognition of the monumental path to this moment, rather than hesitation to undertake the monumental work ahead. We have long known what has to be done. We have long possessed the technological capabilities to do it. And renewable energy systems and solutions will not only reduce pollution for these communities, create jobs and build resiliency. They will also provide a pathway to decentralized and democratized energy systems that prioritize community ownership and participation. That is why young people in New York City are showing up at city hearings, meeting with council members, organizing voter registration drives, mutual aid funds, and most memorably, climate strikes, protests, and direct actions. New York City has made bold commitments to climate justice, including a great one today, just like so many of the other cities involved in C40's pledge, but we are pushing them to go even further in the timeline and scope of their response. This is what resistance looks like in urban settings, and it is the only path that will bring a socially and economically just and sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jade, not just for your remarks today, but for your ongoing leadership. I, I think it's very fair to say that it's the leadership of you and others in the climate movement have really ensured that the world is in a place today where the rapid equitable action we need is much more likely to happen. And thank you for your in incredible work and important leadership uh, on that mission. Um, 
your uh, comments are a perfect segue, I think, to our next panel session, which is how do we build people-powered cities? In this session, we're going to do a deep dive into how renewable energy can help cities build more inclusive, resilient, and healthier communities by bringing affordable and reliable energy to all people, no matter where they live. Our moderator for this in-depth conversation will be Laurie Goering, an inspiring journalist and the climate change editor for the Thomson Reuters Foundation's award-winning daily news website on the human impacts of climate change. Laurie, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. Welcome to our second panel today, focusing on how we build people-powered cities. I'm Laurie Gehring, as David said, I'm climate change editor and head of the climate program at the Thomson Reuters Foundation and your host. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our two really interesting panelists today. First is Mayor Mohamed Ajay Soa from the city of Accra and Eduardo Avila, the executive director of Hevelu Solar, an NGO that promotes the sustainable development of low income communities through solar energy. Welcome to you both. Um, your work looks fascinating and I can't wait to hear about it. Uh, Marisola, I'd like to start with you for our first question today. From your perspective, what can renewable energy do to help Accra and other African cities achieve universal access to energy and more broadly to build more inclusive, livable and resilient cities? Thank you very much for having me and thank you very much once again for your kind introduction. Let me start by saying that Accra, like all African cities, are growing at a very fast pace and the continent is projected to have over a billion more people by 2050. The demand for energy is also projected to quadruple and the sources are for the fulfillment of the projected demand is what becomes a point of concern. In the last century, the key sources of energy in most sub-Saharan African countries, including Ghana, was hydro. But we are seeing more and more reduction in the percentages of energy from hydro sources. Now, hydro is now supplying a little under 15% of all energy, and the rest of the 20 and the rest of the 12% is coming more from fossil fuel-based sources. This cannot continue. We in Accra have seen from our climate emissions inventory that 24% of our emissions are from energy use and projected increase demand can be supplied from renewable sources. Mini solar grid connected and independent systems can be the way to go. Fortunately, the legislative work for this has been undertaken by the public utilities regulator, but its implementation is where the challenge is. We are working actively with all stakeholders to ensure that energy transition from new renewable sources is the way to go knowing very well that our main source of energy, which is from hydro, has now dwindled and we are heavily relying on, on fossil fuel sources of energy. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor So it's, It is really interesting that Africa's transition is so different, isn't it? When you have, other other countries they each have their own their own ways but each country in africa is really having a different sort of angle on this because of the the falling hydro with with more drought and irregular rainfall and all the rest eduardo i'd like to ask you the same question with what we've seen through your your work with lower income communities in the favelas of rio what do you feel cities need to do to ensure that their renewable energy strategies address the needs of the most vulnerable residents? How important is it to have co-creation with local communities and civil society to design truly inclusive climate action? And do you have any examples of where this has been done well? Sure, Laurie. Uh, thank you, uh, C40, for the invitation and Laurie for the, the question. 
Uh, it's an honor to be on the panel with the Mayor Aji, Aji as well. And I, first of all, I'm really inspired uh, and energized by the previous discussion and the declaration. I would love to see Rio and Brazilian cities signing the declaration, but yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, Rivo Solar is an example, Laurie. Uh, we are a nonprofit based in Rio uh, with this mission to promote the sustainable development of low-income communities through solar energy. So we do it with distributed solar uh, generation, job training, and environmental education for the children. So uh, I, we see this human side of energy transition. It's an important aspect that we see here. Uh, what cities can do, what can cities do? Uh, in Brazil, the energy sector is regulated by the federal government. So there are some limitations, but I see four, four things, data, education, example, and sponsorship. Uh, first of all, data. Uh, Cities can help local utilities to promote research, research to generate data about energy access in the city, like areas where the energy costs weigh more on family budgets, areas where blackouts happen uh, the most, areas where the service is more difficult to access. And on the other hand, data about renewable energy potential in the city. There are tools like the city solar maps that there are great examples uh, worldwide. Rio did it in 2017, but they left out the low-income communities of the map. Like there's no sun in those communities. And the opposite is true. So this is something that we have to work. The second one is education. Cities can promote awareness campaigns, can promote nudging initiatives to help people make more sustainable decisions. They can promote environmental, environmental education, especially for children and young people, and promote job training programs. And the third one is example. Uh, cities can install solar in their public buildings. This is good for the public safes, and uh, they lead by the example. They can create a positive herd effect. And the fourth one is sponsorship. This can come with direct social investment and tax incentives, especially for low income, but can also be institutionally supporting and connecting with solar investors. So given this distributed and decentralized structure of renewable energy, especially solar, the solutions and innovations will come from the grassroots, from the people. And I think the role of the city is to give visibility for those projects, to connect them with the right partners, and help to provide data and awareness and let, let them do the installations, operations, maintenance, management, and all. Thank you, Eduardo. I mean, it's so interesting that you can create a solar map for a city and leave out the, the favelas, you know, which, which would seem really obvious places to put, put some of this solar, um, particularly as some of them are sitting up on the hills in the city, you know, with good access, right? Fascinating. Um, so clearly these community renewable energy projects like those you've mentioned enable residents to play a more active role in energy generation. But do you think this can help drive broader social and economic transformation and build more connected communities? Me or mayor? Yeah, no, no, please, Eduardo. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, that's exactly what we believe at Revu Solar. The name speaks for itself, right? It's a solar revolution. Uh, the energy prices in Rio have increased 150% in the last decade. And solar is 90% cheaper in the same period. So besides the environmental and economic aspects, the savings, the job creation, I see solar uh, that allows us to finally participate in the energy system, right? Uh, this panel, solar panel, is a, an unprecedented uh, technology, much more than that just blue thing. I think it's a portal that transports us to the energy world. Uh, and Revolu Solar has created now in 2021 the first solar energy cooperative ever in a Brazilian favela. And this cooperative model, uh, uh, apart from the technical and economic advantages related to the scale and using a good sunny roof with ad adequate infrastructure when it compared to individual installations. It's a model that harmonizes with the sense of collectivity, collaboration and cooperation of those communities here. 
And because low-income population doesn't have the, 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 the initial capital required to cover the upfront costs. And a lot of them don't have the adequate roof. So the cooperatives are the most appropriate solution for those cases and to scale up in a country like Brazil. And it can boost the implementation of solar in communities, creating local jobs, not only related to electricians and solar installers, but also as accountants, communications, management and all. So we are seeing that it brings other indirect benefits as well, like the presence of media showing this first solar, uh, low-income community solar in Brazil. The communities are situated close to Copacabana Beach here, and they depend a lot on tourism that was affected by the pandemic. So the solar power plant constitutes a new tourist, uh, tourist, tourist spot there. And, uh, and Rio experiences a particular problem here. Around 25% of energy distributed in Rio is lost with illegal connections. And many people make uh, superficial judgments about it and attack low-income population. But I see this problem as the tip of the iceberg of a deep energy crisis that is expensive, it's unfair pricing, services that are far from the population and poor quality. So I see this new energy model that is community-based uh, helps to solve these most urgent problems of our time, unemployment, expensive and polluting energy, people disconnection from environmental issues. So yeah, I believe in this solar revolution. Thank you. I mean, it's so interesting. I love your description of it as a portal that transports us. You know, that it's not, it's not just about the energy. It's about quite a lot of other things too. And 90% and cheaper, that, that's, um, that's impressive. Um, Mayor Sullivan, let me turn to you. With your experience as a social entrepreneur and your time supporting those working in the informal economy in Ghana, what do you think your city needs to be able to fully embrace the renewables opportunity? Thank you very much once again. Um, first of all, I, I fully associate myself with the position um, um, expelled by my co-panelists on, on the real scenario um, on energy um, and the use of solar, especially in low income. I'm so sorry, uh, uh, Mayor. So we're, we're having a lot of trouble with the technical connection and hearing you. Uh, so to run up, I'm just saying that uh, what we do is to ensure that um, the uh, provide some development. We use uh, the authority to grant permits as a bait to encourage developers to move into um, a green building because this, the skyline has changed and many of the properties that are coming up are using largely European model. And that's how come um, uh, uh, our energy um, uh, that we suck from uh, uh, buildings are going up and is around 24%. And that's what we are trying to increase. And then the secondly, we are also trying as much as possible to promote private investment because as much as we have solar um, all year round, the initial investment for a property owner to own solar is so high than spreading it over a long time as we, we, we enjoy currently. So we need to find the model that it's suitable for the average citizen in Accra and, and the low income communities so that they can also patronize the use of solar. Thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, I think that's so important, isn't it? That, that the, you have to figure out with these things that have the high upfront costs, how to actually make that happen for people who, who would love to do it, but don't always uh, have the money up front to make it possible. And, and certainly adopting European models for Africa is not, doesn't make sense when Africa uh, countries have plenty of their own uh, good ideas on this. Um, I'd like to end with one final question for both of you. 
We, we uh, just heard Jay, a member of the C40 Global Youth and Mayors Forum, tell us that climate justice needs to go hand in hand with racial and social justice, and that community energy projects are a powerful way of achieving this. What role do you have in delivering this kind of change for the energy transition? Mayor Sowa, would you like to take that one first? Basically, Accra and um, uh, it's not different. The situation is different from uh, what happens across the continent. And um, uh, we hosted uh, uh, a mayoral conference on energy transition a couple of weeks ago. Uh, uh, my apologies. It's uh, uh, we love to hear from him, but it's uh, proving a little difficult with the connection. Eduardo, if you don't mind, can I turn to you with that question? Um, and can you just tell us a little bit more? I know you've already talked about this a bit, but but how community energy projects are a way of a, of, a, of achieving this kind of change. You know, what what role they have in delivering this change that we need to see more broadly around racial and social. Change. Yeah. I totally agree with uh, Mayor. Uh, we need to create a new energy model that is adapted to those uh, uh, situations. So uh, basically what we are trying to do here is to create an economic model that they pay monthly fees, not one initial upfront cost because the panels have 25 years of a life cycle. You can pay monthly in three or four years. In Rio, you pay the, 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 the investment. So... Uh, in a more big picture, uh, besides the social and economic crisis in Brazil, Brazil is experiencing one of the most severe energy crises in history. Uh, we depend here basically on hydropower and climate change is leading to a severe water crisis here. And Brazilian policymakers are choosing the fossil fuels path to overcome it, that we know it's more expensive and polluting. Uh, and we know that developing countries need to use more energy to in the post-pandemic recovery, and we can all, no longer uh, use uh, the traditional fossil fuel solution. So I think developed countries uh, have a responsibility to support developing countries in this just energy transition, because it is these mo most vulner vulnerable groups that feel the impact of the climate change the most. They are the ones who are more affected by the higher energy costs we're talking about. They are those who do not have the initial capital we're talking uh, about the, and the information to benefit from the opportunities of this new green economy. They are the ones who, who feel first the ongoing climate disasters. Uh, they are the ones who have the least resources to defend themselves from this situation. So I see my role here and Revo Solar as contributing to create this new energy model that is community-based, social and economically adapted, uh, that enables these low-income communities to benefit from solar revolution. It is totally possible. Thank you so much. It's a, it really is something, isn't it? When you, when you can put this affordable energy in the hands of people that didn't have it before and actually make it much cheaper than what they're paying now for anything that they would be getting that opens up so much space in 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 many different directions for for advancement for people. Um, thank you both so much for the stories you've shared with us today. It's so interesting, and it it makes clear that with determination and the vision, you you really can change things, it, it, including for these people who are most vulnerable and might be left behind otherwise. Sadly, though, we've come to an end of this uh, great panel session. I'd really like to thank Mayor Sowa and Eduardo Avila for their time and insight, and all of you for taking the time to watch. And my apologies for the technical uh, errors. We'll, we'll, we do our best, but sometimes people drop off. Now I'll pass back to David Miller. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Laurie, for that very enlightening panel. And I'd like to thank the two panelists. Eduardo, thank you very much for your leadership on the ground and making a real difference. And Mayor Sowa, uh, we missed some of your remarks because of the technical difficulties, but for those who don't know, Mayor Soa is an incredible leader in bringing together the needed energy transition and addressing a variety of causes of climate change, for example, waste management, in a way that ensures the least well-off really have opportunity. 
in uh, what's been happening in Accra is a model for global cities around the world uh, in, in the North and South. And Mayor So, we're very honored that you made the time to be with us today and very much appreciate uh, the leadership that you've shown in Accra, the very effective uh, leadership. Um, I think that panel and conversation showed us how renewables are not only good for our climate, but can help build more equitable, resilient, and economically prosperous cities. And if you want to join the conversation about that issue or anything else we've discussed today, uh, please join in on social media using the hashtags the future we want and clean energy. We're now moving on to the last segment uh, of today. We will focus on investing in a fair and just energy transition. I have the great pleasure of welcoming a special guest to discuss how local renewable energy projects can create job opportunities and catalyze local, develop, local development while helping renewable markets to grow. We will also outline the importance for cities to be able to access public and private sources of finance to implement their ambitious climate and energy plans. Shui Tanaka is a visiting professor in practice at the London School of Economics, also serving as principal finance advisor at C40 Cities. Joshua has been working on development, environmental and urban finance for 40 years, starting in Brazil and then at the World Bank before becoming a founding leader of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Thank you for being here with us today. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to get your expertise and in-depth knowledge of how do we finance a fair and just energy transition. So uh, I think first question I have is today, 15 cities are committing their ambition on energy decarbonization through signing the C40 Renewable Energy Declaration. They have a target, they have a plan, but often they can't access the financial resources to implement the plan. How can public finance providers help cities overcome these challenges? Well, um, thank you. Hello, everybody. And uh, thank you, David. And also thank you very much to, I would say, all the previous speakers. And I really enjoyed the, the, the range of views, you know, that, that we have, you know, mayors, you know, innovators such as uh, Ina and, and Eduardo. I mean, industry, you know, Vattenfall. So I thought it was really great, you know, to look at this question, you know, with those different uh, angles. So first of all, I think it's important to acknowledge and congratulate the cities, you know, for their ambition and for the formulation of plans. That's a key step. However, I think we also need to be clear that unfortunately, there is still a real challenge in channeling financing to support the implementation of these plans. And it's really urgent, you know, to put in place efficient solutions that address cities' finance challenges and constraints. And unfortunately, I would have to say, the pandemic and the period that we're living does not help. Uh, to answer your question, perhaps uh, four points, you know, in terms of what public finance can do to address these challenges. First and foremost, focus on climate. Sounds obvious. There has been quite a lot of progress in that. But unless finance institutions really focus on that, then, you know, the subset of city climate action, you know, is not going to be served well. The second one is therefore for organizations, you know, for financial institutions developing, you know, climate action and financing climate action, then I believe it is important that they develop what I would call urban climate finance programs. In other words, an understanding of how you support decarbonization, how you support the solutions that were discussed you know, in previous um, segments you know, of, of our event today, and also deal with difficult rising issues such as uh, adaptation. The third, I think, is also in terms of public finance to recognize the importance of concessional finance, particularly for the global south. You know all the discussion about the famous 100 billion. Well, you know, issues that were mentioned in previous segments of the event linked to affordability and the cost of capital, you know, those have to be addressed. 
And fourth, I think it's also very important when we talk public finance, that we all know public finance will not have the scale necessary to address the issue. So using public finance to mobilize uh, private finance is absolutely key. And I think also finally to link to the specific topic of this event on renewable energy, as was mentioned, a lot of the decentralized energy solutions can be financed by the private sector very often at the household level. So Joshua, that leads me to next question. Given your experience, do you, are you aware of some successful models or examples where cities have been able to finance sustainable infrastructure projects uh, and or successful examples of the point you just made about finding funding sources for uh, local renewable energy projects? Look, David, I think uh, the availability of examples, there are plenty, you know, uh, hundreds, thousands, you know, of examples. I just take two, you know, but again, just more as illustrations, you know, rather than I would say, uh, you know, emblematic, you know, uh, activities. One is, for example, solar heating development, you know, solar water heater uh, program in Tunisia, for example. That was a very interesting program run by utility, right? And what they were doing was in particularly addressing the issue that was mentioned before in the event, which is the famous upfront cost you know, issue of installation. So what happened in that particular model? Well, you know, the utility installed the solar water heater and then you know, the uh, customer essentially repaid the value of that investment over a five year period as part of the bill. And by the way, part of it was also that they were saving if you want in their electricity bill by having you know the solar water heater which helped them you know repay you know uh, that loan result of that 71 million you know public 224 million private finance 3500 jobs you know direct you know that fits you know also with one of the topics of our event today so that's i would say one example a second example would be uh other country, a bit colder, uh, Slovak Republic. So there you use different form of intermediary, banks, right? To finance small and medium-sized renewable energy and energy efficiency. Just to be uh, precise, loans between 20,000 euros, okay? So this is, you know, at least for a country like uh, Slovakia, relatively small, you know, loan all the way to medium-sized investment about two and a half million. Result of these facilities, 700 sustainable energy investments, 200 million investment. And I think it's very important when we talk climate to also see what the impact in emissions is. So this program essentially uh, had energy savings equivalent to the total household electricity consumption of the capital city of Slovakia, Bratislava. Okay. So Another very quick point here, important to link to the social aspect. Very interesting that when we did further analysis, it turned out when we interviewed, uh, I would say a pensioner, that that pensioner said the savings on the energy bill translated in the equivalent of an additional month of pension payment for that person. So that's the type of thing you know, that you try to do uh, in this. I could go with many other examples. Vattenfall mentioned district heating systems, very important element and lots of opportunity there for renewable. Now, I need to close by basically saying, that's all nice, very good, lots of examples. And as you know, in conferences, we can go on. The issue is scale and timing, right? That, you know, lots of good projects happening, lots of cities showing, you know, innovation but it's not scaling up at the speed that we need to. And therefore that's a big challenge, both from a technical point of view, but also for the finance to support that. Joshua, that's um, cautionary and inspiring in, in equal measure and very interesting to hear examples from cities as different as those in Tunisia and Bratislava. So thank you very much for bringing your expertise here. If we had time, I was gonna ask you about 
the 100 billion of climate finance to the for, to support developing nations because i think city action there with that funding uh, really matters but unfortunately we're out of time so i have to thank you for your contribution today for your cautionary note that we need to build scale but i'm going to take the optimistic note from your remarks that there are good examples on which we can start if we can use concessionary and private finance together to build scale. So thank you very much uh, for being here and for your ongoing work on this critical issue of finance. We're now coming towards the end of today's event. Our last speaker has served as the executive director of C40 Cities for nearly eight years during which time the organization has grown from what it was originally, 40 cities, to almost 100 of the world's largest and most influential cities. And from a modest staff to more than 250 staff across the globe, helping the mayors of those cities implement ambitious climate action. From inception, C40 has been a high ambition leadership group and the leader, our leader, is Mark Watts, our executive director, who insists that our cities must help the world half global emissions by 2030 by taking actions today in order to make sure that the world avoids climate catastrophe. Mark, thanks so much for being here live with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, David. And what, what a great panel. I, I'm sure, David, you feel the same as me. It's just been a, a privilege to be able to, to listen uh, and learn. And I, I think, uh, particularly great. We've had an, uh, an event with so many young leaders and so many women leading the energy revolution. I feel somewhat bad that as a result of my participation, we're, we're ending with a, a boring white middle-aged man, but at, at least today I am in the minority. Um, but I do, I do want to thank everybody for their participation, obviously, particularly uh, our C40 mayors, Mayor Garcetti, Lord Mayor Moore and Mayor Sower. And perhaps just in closing, just a, a reminder, that the backdrop to this event today is that 15 cities are stepping up their ambition through endorsing that newly launched C40 Renewable Energy Declaration. And they're all through different pathways committing to the highest targets on clean energy deployment, following what the science says is necessary, whether that's decarbonising electricity supply by 2035, we heard of LA's leadership on that, or achieving universal access to energy uh, in the next next uh, decade uh, and that leadership is going to build dynamic local markets which the likes of the wonderful companies Vattenfall etc we've heard from are really able to thrive uh, and prosper in. It, it, it's been great just listening to those different examples you know hearing Meg Garcetti and Lauren talk about LA100 it, it's just that is a, a world leading program 100% clean energy by 2035 that nation states let alone are the cities could learn from. Or hearing Lord Mayor Moore talk about how Sydney's hit its operational target for renewable energy nine years ahead of schedule. That's, that's what we need to overcome the climate crisis. And I thought that towards the end, you know, it was a really insightful discussion about the possibilities for increasing access to energy, particularly uh, in informal settlements for the most vulnerable people in our cities across the world, in, in Rio and Accra and those examples, but making that energy cheaper than it might than it was uh, previously, uh, and some of the, the examples of collaboration. That's clearly what we're we're going to need going forward. It was it was it really warmed my heart to hear uh, Ina talking about how winning the C40 Women for Climate Prize had then helped her startup company develop a technology that might go on to benefit cities all around the world. What I take take out of this is that mayors are clearly doing their job. Notwithstanding Jade's comments, uh, an activist always could, should be pushing uh, for more. But C40 mayors really are demonstrating today that science-based political leadership on energy decarbonation that the whole world needs to follow. Now we expect others to step up. Certainly that means more national government support. And I, I was struck again at the example in Los Angeles that the LA benefited from the US National Renewable Energy Laboratory to develop a lot of that thinking about how to achieve uh, their, their target. And we're now a C40 looking forward to developing that partnership uh, with other cities um, around the world. And we need similar initiatives in other countries that perhaps might come uh, from the likes of the forward looking energy companies featured in today's event. 
we also, as we heard from, from Josue and others towards the end, we need to shift the dial on financing city clean energy. There was um, a C40 African Mayor's Dialogue on Energy Access and Renewable Energy uh, a week or so ago, and it's really clear message coming out of that, that finance remains the key barrier for cities to achieve universal access to clean electricity, but also that there's a big pipeline of potential projects there. If, as Josue set out, we can shift the finance to a different scale uh, in order to make this energy revolution possible. So I, I, want, I want to finish uh, because we're in the, the week of the UN General Assembly. And I've, I've been constantly repeating a point that the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres made this week, that we're at an inflection point in history. And what we do next, meaning right now, is going to determine whether human civilization breaks down or breaks through to a new era of prosperity. We've got unprecedented level of public investment going into recovery from the pandemic. And if it's directed in the right way to green just economies, it really can achieve that prosperous climate safe future. But it's the decisions made right now, the budget set this year, the investments made in the next few months that are gonna determine that. And what we heard today is mayors and cities are really showing the political leadership that's necessary and as of today, they've got a, a new string to their bow in the shape of the C40 Renewable Energy Declaration. Thanks so much for a really wonderful event. Thank you very much, Mark, for those superb final remarks and a very strong call for a green and just recovery. I'd like to thank again all of our inspiring speakers today. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, to hear their remarks uh, in today's session on the urban energy transition. And on behalf of C40 Cities, I'd like to thank all of our audience who have joined us today for this leading edge event. A rolling theme during the last 90 minutes has been the importance of collaboration in creating a green and just recovery from the global health pandemic and the climate crisis in order to create sustainable, equitable, and vibrant cities and communities that leave no one behind. Although that brings us to the end of today's session, please continue the conversation on social media using the hashtags the future we want and clean energy, or visit the C40 website for more information. From all of us at C40 Cities, I'd like to wish you a good evening, afternoon, or morning. Thank you and goodbye.